celebrities in the audience here tonight, all of whom are going to talk, right, Supervisor? No. No. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, let me tell you, this is, a, uh, this is an organization, Delta Stewardship Council, that got formed as part of some legislation passed and signed into law in 2009. And Delta Stewardship Council got created, and it was directed by law to kind of do the following things. One, to develop a legally enforceable called Delta Plan. And that Delta Plan was to be developed, adopted, and we begin implementing it no later than January 1st, 2012. Unlike a lot of other activities that go on in the federal government and the state government, we have a statutory deadline. We intend to keep that deadline. We're ordered to keep it. Um, and that's what we are busily engaged in doing. Uh, Joe Grindstaff, our executive director, is going to be talking to you in just a minute. But the legislation uh, is, fun is founded on some pretty clear things. What Joe will tell you about, it's called the co-equal goals. And that is a co-equal goal for the state of California of a reli more reliable water system for California and a protected and improved Delta ecosystem to be done in a way that is respectful of the Delta, its unique characteristics as an evolving place. Uh, in addition, the legislature laid out, and Joe will tell you about this, eight objectives that are necessary to meet that goal. I predict some of them you'll like and others you won't. Uh, but that's the law. Uh, that's what we're doing. Because it is, uh, the Delta plan when it's adopted will be a state regulation. You know, it's, it's legally enforceable. Uh, we are going through a very complicated environmental review process as the law requires. So we have a, a Delta plan being developed. Uh, there will be seven drafts of it, you'll see, between now and the end of the year with full opportunities to comment. There will be a separate environmental document about all of that, studying various alternatives and options. Pretty complicated process. These meetings, the seven scoping meetings, are really designed more as listening sessions than anything else. Uh, a couple of you were at our Sacramento session uh, this morning, uh, where probably the same number of people, maybe even a bit more, sat in the audience, and only four or five people said anything. And I, I told them that my, uh, my uh, advanced age has led me to learn some things about politics, which are basically that everybody wants you to ask first of what you want or don't want. But really, they want you to tell them what you're going to do. And this is a listening session. And I fully expect when we come out with our first draft Delta plan, the first of seven, which will be on February 14th, we'll hear from you all over again at all these meetings telling us what you do or don't like in the documents we're looking at. Uh, it's a pretty inclusive process. We're here to, to listen. Uh, we've learned at our, from our meetings in Diamond Bar down south, Merced, Concord, Sacramento, and now Knight, we've learned some people will have things to say about the scoping process. Some thing, folks will have things to say about other things, all related to water and uh, community efforts and so on. All of it's welcome. Uh, Pat and I are the two members of the council who are here tonight, but uh, our lawyer said, make one thing clear. Anything you guys say, you're saying on your own. The council is not here acting tonight. It's just a couple of members who are receiving it. Also, Sitting over there uh, is a court reporter because we're taking down the, the, the exact words at this meeting as we're doing with all of them. And that will be available because this is, this is a legal process required to do the environmental impact report. We're also recording this session and we'll put up on our website within 24 hours a copy of the recording of this uh, as we've done with the other uh, three, three meetings now. We haven't gotten the Sacramento meeting up from this morning. So we'd ask you when you, when you say, want to say something to us, there's, there are forms up here and I think there's some outside, these blue forms. And if you can print your name clearly, uh, Joe yells at me we, when I try to write something out because he never can read what I read and our court reporter and, and the folks who do this want to keep the names and the spelling correctly. So anyway, uh, let me introduce if I could, uh, Joe Grindstaff, the executive director. Thanks, Phil. And Phil's already covered most of the things I need to say, so hopefully I can be really quick here and move ahead. You've uh, seen 
Uh, Pat Johnston and Phil, Don Natoli is also planning to be here tonight, uh, so I would expect him later on. I'm Joe Grindstaff. Keith Coolidge is right over here, so if you need anything, feel free to talk to Keith. Eric Alvarez, where Eric's standing at the back, if you have any questions, and Gwen Buchholz, where Gwen? Gwen's standing at the back, too. So if you guys have any questions and would like to talk to anybody about these issues after we're done with the meeting, feel free to do that. This is about uh, a scoping process as part of the environmental document. We kind of laid out here are objectives and here are some potential strategies we want to consider when we develop the Delta Plan. We want to hear from you about what we should be considering, what we may have left out, what things we shouldn't be considering that we've got in the document. This is really about hearing from you about what it is we should consider as we develop uh, the Delta Plan. At the end of the meeting, we'll also have an opportunity for people to talk about other things that aren't part of scoping, but that are important to you and that pertain to what the council, council does. Phil mentioned the co-equal goals. I wanted to put them up now. This is the exact language from the statute, and I'll put them back up here when we come to the comments part so, so everybody can have them imbued in their consciousness the way uh, they're uh, seared into ours. A uh, couple of key things I should talk about. This is different than many studies or plans because the objectives for the Delta Plan were laid out in law. So some things we know. The state legislature required that we develop this plan. They laid out the objectives in law. We have a copy of the law at the back of the room if anybody would like their own copy. In order to implement that, we have a study area, and the primary study area is the Delta and Susun Marsh. But beyond that, the study area extends upstream into the watershed and also all the way out to all of the areas that get export water because there may be parts of the Delta Plan that impact those areas. You can imagine that's controversial with some. But we feel that in order to implement what we're supposed to do in the legislation, that's something we have to do. As I mentioned, the notice of preparation includes some preliminary strategies to, the, to help us think about what are the things we could do in order to meet the objectives of the legislation. And then lastly, I want to talk about BDCP. BDCP is uh, the plan that includes con a conservation plan, an NCCP, a Natural Communities Conservation Plan. There, I got it right. And uh, conveyance. It's the plan that you've all heard about that would build, right now I think their, the favored proposal as I hear it is a tunnel uh, through the delta, would put new intakes in the northern part of the delta and, and move water south to avoid some of the uh, conflicts with fish, would also continue to pump in the South Delta, so I think about 30% of the water in their latest plan would pump some water in the South Delta and uh, have a large conservation area altogether, tens of thousands of acres of conservation, I think 65,000 acres of wetlands restoration, significant amount. That's the BDCP, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. The legislation didn't give us options on BDCP. What it said was that if the BDCP was complete, it had to meet certain objectives, and it listed them out in the law. And again, you can look these up there, and it says the director of fish and game at the end of the process is to determine if BDCP meets these standards. If it does, the council is required to put BDCP into the Delta Plan. It does have a provision that the council, in the end, can become an appeal body on that decision by the Director of Fish and Game. So it's kind of an awkward, different kind of relationship. It's an interesting relationship. 
So BDCP is underway. It is not likely to be finished before the Delta plan is done. We will meet our stat statutory deadline. My expectation is it will take them at least another year, maybe another couple years, to get BDCP complete. And at that point, the decisions about BDCP being incorporated into the Del Delta plan will be made. As Phil mentioned, we've had a number of scoping meetings, and we have a couple more after tonight, uh, one in Stockton and one up in Chico. Uh, they've been interesting. Uh, we intend to learn something, and I have learned a few things already in the meetings that we've had, and we will use the scoping comments in the preparation of the draft EIR. So I wanted to go over the schedule because we're, we're on a very rapid schedule. We're going to complete scoping in January. And the plan is to actually have a draft Delta plan, obviously with holes and not complete, but the first draft of a plan in February. We're planning to have four days of meetings per month beginning uh, at the end of February, so March, April, and May, and to have a new update of the Delta plan every month all the way through till the end of May. So by the end of May, we will have had four drafts of the Delta plan, and boy, I haven't even added up how many days of meetings, but many, many, many days of meetings. The expectation is that at the end of May, the council will be able to give direction to actually publish a Delta plan, and obviously it will have been published before because it's going to be up on the web and there will be all these discussions online, but they will actually get to a point where they can publish a plan and go through the legal process of asking for comments and also publishing a draft EIR. So that should happen in June. They should approve it in May, we're hoping and uh, then it goes out for public comment, a formal public comment process in June. And our expectation is that comes back uh, at the end of July and starting in August, we actually take all of the comments. The council has more meetings and has a revised draft Delta plan. So that would be the fifth draft Delta plan. They make revisions to that. We have a sixth draft and the final plan is on the seventh draft come November that the council actually adopts the Delta plan. Now, as the chair pointed out, uh, this Delta plan is supposed to be enforceable, and that means we have to make it into a regulation. So after it completes all of this stuff and the council adopts it in November, it has to go to the Office of Administrative Law, and it becomes a regulation. So the, it, it's a long process, and believe me, this is light speed for state government to go through this this quickly. But the plan will be adopted by the council in November, and we'll actually have it in effect in January so we can begin implementation of the plan. So second point, you already know that we have a court reporter and everything's being recorded. If you would prefer to write your comments out tonight and hand those in and not speak at all, that's fine. If you would like to send a letter to us, we have the address. Feel free to send us a letter. If you'd like to send an email, uh, we post emails immediately. Send off every, every single email comment that we get to uh, all of our council members, and it's important. And they actually do read them because I've gotten phone calls from council members about well, this person commented this, and what do you think about that? This is not something that they just ignore. Uh, they pay real attention to what people say. Sometimes we get inundated. The Sierra Club today sent us over 3,000 emails. Fortunately, they were all the same email, so we knew, you know, members of the Sierra Club did, so we knew this, we, and we, we have all of those, but that, that made it somewhat easier. Otherwise, we might overwhelm the council. Uh, but we still, we still end up getting significant comments almost every single day. And I really encourage you to take the time to write them down and send them to us. They will be 
read and paid attention to. As I mentioned, at the very end, after we've had all of the comments on scoping, there will be a period for public comment. So if anybody has any comments at the very end, feel free to do that. With that, I'm going to go back to the co-equal goals and hand the mic back to the chair. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, a couple people have submitted the blue forms already. Dave Sterling's going to sign a uh, third blue form uh, when he gets around to it. Uh, and Mark Pruner, you said you wanted to be last, but your form was first. Where are you? Did he go down? He's disappeared. Oh, he's disappeared momentarily. Okay. Uh, Mr. Verboon. Mr. Verboon. Verboon Farms. Yes, sir. Uh, either microphone uh, should be working. Uh, give, it a, give it a little pop with your finger just to test it out, if you would, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think it's... Is it working? Yeah. Kind, of, kind of quiet, but... Works all right? All right. Can you, can you hear back there? Can the audience hear his comments? No. Let's try the other one. Make sure, make sure this will work a little bit better? Yes, oh, sir, yeah. it does. Okay. I'm, I'm here uh, from Layton, California. I'm, uh, I'm a farmer. Uh, I'm not directly impacted by the, anything that happens up here, but uh, I have a lot of neighbors that are. Uh, things the, the, the impacts that I want to see studied in this deal are all of the impacts, and that would include upstream diversions before they get to the delta that are diverted in and around and under the delta, uh, the reverse flows, and, and what can be done to offset the reverse flows. The, uh, the delta exports, of course, is going to be a factor. Uh, wastewater discharges into the bay and the delta because there's still wastewater discharges that need to be cleaned up that are going into Suisun Bay. Uh, predator fish control, we need to kind of get that population back in balance if we're ever going to get the, the salmon and the, and the delta smelt survived. And invasive species. And salinity control that is, is I know, is a concern up in this area. And, and a valid concern. And with that, if there's questions, I would. Uh, just a, su a suggestion. Uh, Joe had mentioned that there are copies of the governance law that set us up and, and talk about the Delta plan. Yeah, you've got that. Page 20 on the, uh, under Delta policy are the eight statutory objectives that the legislature set out. Yes. There are many other provisions in the bill that apply to this Delta plan, but if you start there, I think you're going to find all of them fit in those general categories, and there are specific directions for us on invasive species, on uh, extensive uh, discussion of water flows for both the Water Board, for the Department of Fish and Game, and for us to consider in the Delta plan. The, uh, the, the reason that, that the last thing that I said was for salinity control is because, you know, the delta, nobody is going to argue that the delta is in a state of decline. I mean, that's just uh, not disputable, okay? If you go with the Bay Delta Conservation Plan as currently construed, and I'm not going to make any friends back home with this statement, you're simply creating another upstream diversion that's going to further allow the intrusion of salinity because you're going to lower the level upstream. And... You know, I personally believe that, that at some point there's going to have to be all of the, the contributors to the upstream diversions are going to have to contribute water back to the delta because the, the downstream focus that has been there in the past simply cannot uh, solve the issues. It'll come as no surprise to you that at our Merced meeting and I predicted our Chico meeting, the argument will be directly contrary to the one you've made. Their argument is that only exporters of water from the Delta are responsible for anything to do with it. I mean, it's, we hear that a lot. But yes, we were. I, that, that, that was the only main comments okay, I wanted to get into the record, so. Mr. Verboom, thank you very much. Thank you. Very helpful. Uh, Mr. Van Loben Sells. Right there, yeah. 
Mr. Van Lobensels has made approximately 75 scoping comments on various plans and reports in his career and is more expert than almost anybody else in this room, certainly I, more expert than me. I, I, I don't think it's that many, for, uh, Chairman Eisenberg, but uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, it's, um, it's an opportunity that uh, this community uh, values to be able to uh, come walk across town and, and, uh, and give our scoping meeting coping comments. I've, I've read your document pretty thoroughly, and uh, there are certain areas that I'd like to address. Um, the, uh, on page nine, uh, there's a discussion about- Are, are you talking about this notice of preparation yes. document? Uh, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a, this, is, this is how the environmental process starts. Law requires right. a notice and, of preparation. So he's referring to this document, which many of you picked up outside, Molay Page. Yeah, and I think this is, this is the starting point that you, you're coming from. Yes, sir. Uh, you refer, uh, that's a, there's a re reference to reasonable and be beneficial use of water and how that should govern uh, the water plan for the entire state of California. Yes, sir. And my question's there, and, and it needs to be clearly defined what, what that means, uh, who will define it, who will enforce it, and um, you know, if it's, if it's a, a whole consortium of agencies that are going to do it, uh, there needs to be some consistency and some understanding of it before we get very far in the environmental process. Yeah, the, uh the, uh, the statute that created us referred to two things, the reasonable and beneficial use doctrine, which is a provision of the state constitution going back to 1928. And it says that water should be used beneficially, it should be used reasonably, and there can be no wasting. Uh, the responsibility enforce with enforcing that provision has always rested with the water board or its predecessor agency but also the Department of Water Resources has certain functions in that regard. That and the public trust doctrine, which is a long-standing uh, doctrine recognized by the California Supreme Court as constitutional doctrine as well, have been used over the years. The courts can do it, regulatory agencies can do it, and the statute told us that they I, had I, a preference of that, I, but it, it's... I, I realize yeah. all of those, it, but, but as we go through the environmental document to understand what this really means, those need to be further fleshed out, other than just left as reasonable use and beneficial use. I agree. And so we need to understand what those mean. Um, the NOP identifies two planning areas, and I think it might be more appropriate to have three. You, uh, the NOP identifies the Delta Sassoon Marsh, the Delta Watershed Tributaries, and the export areas are the second. I believe that the watershed and tributaries of the Delta Watershed should be a second, and the third should be areas that use water exported from the Delta. And the reason I think there should be three, uh, uh, those two should be divided, is water that's used in a watershed tends to be used and reused, used for the environment as it goes through the process. Whereas water that is exported, um, once it's removed from the watershed, all beneficial uses for that watershed are removed. And the impacts are different depending upon the diversion point and the amount of diversion. So because there are going to be different impacts from diversions within a watershed, as opposed to those exported from a watershed, I think those two areas should be separated and you should have three areas uh, looked at. Well, I, I don't even know the legal implications of that, of doing an amendment right. to the NOP. Let me think about that. It's clear that all the territory you're talking about is within the planning areas designated, but we designated, I think it's the primary area of the statutory delta and the Susun Marsh, which is the area the legislation called for, and then the water uh, shed folks and the water exporter areas. You had a, well, yeah. But, but in the planning document on page 12 and 13, yep. you identify two areas of concentration, the Delta Sassoon Marsh and the Delta Watershed and export water users. Yep. So uh, I think that should be divided into three because the impacts are different. In, in an environmental document, you have to identify the impacts and mitigate for them because the impacts are different. I think that they, they should be treated differently. Fair point. Um, on page 14, you talk about quantified and otherwise measurable targets associated with co-equal goals. Um, the co-equal goals have a third part to it, the equal, uh, achieved in a manner that protects and enhances the unique values of the Delta as an evolving place, and I think those same quantifiable and measurable targets should be applied to that. Yeah, the, uh, the legislation told us to do targets and performance measures kind of pretty well throughout, which is not usual for 
directions from the legislature, and we're struggling with trying to figure out what they should be. So it, if you come up with specific ideas related to elements of this, where you think you know what a performance measure should be or a target, we would very much like to know that. Uh, let me work on that, but I think on that third part, we, we can develop some criteria that would tell us whether we're being successful on preserving the delta or not. I agree. And I, and I think uh, we, could, we could work on that. Um, on page 17 and 18, uh, there's a reference to agricultural water conservation requirements that expand upon the objections of F SBX 7 mm -hmm. uh, to include all technically feasible, efficient management practices. Um, I'd, I'd like to see a, a, an economic element put into that, uh, and so it might be read economically feasible. Uh, if it's technically feasible, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that can be put into practice. Okay. Um, we're, we're marking all these down. And yeah, we'll no, that's fine. Should go through the list for you. Page okay. 20. Page 20. Page 2 protect and enhance the delta is an evolving place. Mm -hmm. Provisions for sea level and changes in the storm pattern runoff. Uh, there's, there's no explanation of what is meant there, but I think uh, you've got some verbiage in here on page uh, 27. Be because you talk about 55 inches above sea level, but in reality, that's going to happen over a long period of time. And so to develop a plan to, to, to pr prepare for that, it would uh, probably be uh, not the, appropriate. Yeah, what, what, we've, what we've said on that, as you know, the statute mentions up to 55 inches of potential sea level rise by the year 2100. And the year 2100 is the furthest limit of what we're planning for. So we're thinking, this is, we've talked about it, we're not sure yet, we're thinking of various judgments at various dates, because certainly by 2025, it won't be anywhere near that, and so on. On 27, you have under hydrology and water uh, quality, the statement, um, the EIR addressable ability for water supplies to support flow patterns and appropriate water required, required for the existing, and then it goes on to say, analysis would be conducted assuming existing sea level and hydrological conditions and a range of future conditions. So with regards to uh, page 20, and protecting and enhancing the deltas and alving place, I, I propose that you do that as well. Have a range of, of different uh, conditions that you prepare um, a, a plan for. I, I, I think that's what the staff is going to be doing, and we appreciate If you have some suggestions later as to what the levels might be at what times, I mean, we're actually, yeah. you know, we're looking for those suggestions. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I, I appreciate that under hydrology, you start off with the current conditions because yeah. that's where I, I, you, you have to I think that. you have to start and, yep. and, uh, and try to protect that in the plan. Um, under land use uh, strategies on page 21, I have the same comment. Uh, you need to prepare for a, a plan for a series of, of um, hydrological conditions. Um, page uh, 21, reduce risk to people, property, and state interest. Uh, there needs to be a recognition of the role and authority of reclamation districts. Um, and uh, I think you have the state, uh, yeah. the state agencies are involved yeah. in that, but I think you yeah, need to have reclamation we've districts. We've been meeting and we're listing all the reclamation districts, of I which saw there are list, many, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as, as potential responsible agencies under this. Um, under you, uh, under, um, uh, on page 23, Lines 33 to 34, the NOP states, consider expanding in practice and or legislation the ability to use eminent domain procedures to further policy objectives of the act. I, I, I think the council needs to understand the impacts of the threat of eminent domain. The threat of eminent domain, whether it's expanded or not expanded, just the threat of eminent domain shuts down the economic engine of the Delta. It, it, it stops sales, it stops investment. You can't plan for the future and where we come from, the future isn't one generation, it's three or four generations. And so uh, I, I encourage you strongly to, to retract from as much as you can from eminent day, domain, as far away, limit it as, as much as you can in this plan because otherwise we'll have a 50 year plan that will just absolutely shut down the economic engine of the Delta. Um, utilities and public services, uh, flood control should be added as one of the uh, public services after drainage facilities. That's on page 29. And finally, I, I think the role of levies and their relationship to the co-equal values and the protection of the Delta 
are, are understated in this scoping comments. Uh, levees convey water. Uh, they'll be part of any conveyance future in the short and interim period and perhaps even the long-term periods. Levees improve water quality by keeping salt water out, um, by allowing for flow to, to mix. Uh, levees protect, protect uh, environments. Terrestrial avian uh, critters depend upon levees and, and the land behind them. Much of the, much of the food source for migratory waterfowl through the delta comes from the agriculture behind levees. Uh, levees make it possible to protect and enhance the delta as, as the um, co-equal goals in, in response to the delta uh, require. And they reduce risk to property and state interests. I think if you look at, at the end, you create a whole list of the different areas of impacts that you're going to look at. And most of them, the levees are instrumental in, in reducing the impacts and protecting the values uh, that you have there. We're, uh, I, I should tell you, we're struggling with the question of how far state obligation should go legally to maintain non-project levies, and any advice you have for us on that would be very much appreciated. You, you understand the financial implications are immense, but put aside that for a minute. Yeah, I understand that, but if we're gonna spend up to $20 billion on some kind of a system, we already have a system in place, and it's a matter of making that system work. And I think it would be far less expensive to take the system we have today and deal with it. But that's something that, that you're going to deal with in your, in your EIR. Uh, but those are the comments on your, on your scoping document that, um, that, that I had. That's, that, that's very helpful to us. Could I make a request as you think sure. about tonight and your testimony? If, if you want to add anything else, if you want to further refine it, yeah. shoot us an email. We put well, it on the web. That, that would be very helpful to us. In, in this process, I'll probably represent Sacramento County Farm Bureau and the, uh, and, and the, the Delta Caucus, which is the five county farm bureaus. Right. And I, my intention is to try to get you some written comments by the 28th. And it's helpful. Your, the feedback you've just given me now is that would how, be that how, would be how terrific. much detail we should be going to. Sir, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, did Mark Pruner come back in? There he did. I called you first, even though you said last, because your was the very first submitted form, but you were out of the room, Mr. Pruner. By the way, for people who don't know where to find him, every morning on the working day, Pete's Coffee Shop, 19th Street, Sacramento, somewhere between 7 and 8 a.m. And I want to say, Mr. Chairman, that some of my most productive lobbying sessions are there as well. With me, yes. Um, first of all, um, I want to thank you for coming to Clarksburg. I know that you had some options in the Delta and some options around the state. And uh, thank you very much for coming to the North Delta and make it easy. Second of all, thank you for coming in the evening. Some of your meetings are in the daytime. Uh, and for those that work, um, having uh, an evening meeting is much more accessible and it shows that you're willing to, uh, to work with the members of the community, the people that are most impacted by, uh, by what's proposed here. Um, I really enjoy listening to Russ. Russell is always um, really insightful, and he actually reads the material really well and quotes chapter and verse. I'm not going to do that. I just want to make some, some foundational comments that I think um, permeate throughout the document are important and essential to creating something that actually works and something that doesn't leave the communities, the people, the agriculture, and the delta in uh, a diminished state, but rather um, creates uh, an improved environment. Um, I, Russell mentioned flood protection, uh, and, I, and I just, if I may underscore what he said, that flood protection is um, absolutely foundational to everything that we do here, to water quality, to fish, to people, to agriculture, to everything. Uh, and, and, and I know in my mind, flood protection arises to uh, one of the uh, co-equal goals. Uh, I know it's not the co-equal, one of the co-equal goals, but without flood protection, everything else literally perhaps might get washed away, and that would be, of course, in nobody's best interest. Uh, and there's some um, flood protection elements, uh, levy by levy, and the RDs are the, the real... Um, the real library of what flood protection means. So uh, if I could ask your staff to communicate with 999-307-150 and the other 
um, RDs here, reclamation districts, you'll find that in their offices and in their institutional memories, uh, there will be a, a wealth of information that you're just not going to get in a book, a report, or anything else even um, uh, possibly put up by DWR, if I may be respectfully say so. Um, also, part of what we do here, how we live, um, how generations have lived here, I've learned, um, has to do with the special districts and the special organs in the community, uh, whether it's the church, um, the fire department, the schools, um, the um, flower, the, um, the garden clubs, for example. Uh, and I know you can't list every single one, but the point is that uh, the fabric of society and how people relate to each other and how people husband the land has a whole lot to do with how they group together. And it's so easy in a piece of paper to talk about data and facts, figures, population, water flows, fish populations, et cetera, but miss the essential elements that make the Delta work as a place and make it, um, if I can say so, bless the state and become a place of unique, uh, uh, a unique place. Uh, so the, the special districts, even the lighting district here in town, for example, understanding how that functions and, and, and what it does, um, I think is critical to put uh, and to describe in your in, in the EIR as it comes out. Um, and and we, land ownership and water ownership are also fundamental elements of what it means to have life here in the Delta. Uh, and in my um, brief um, perusal of the document handed out back, I didn't see anything about that. I know that other agencies govern that uh, in part, but as a critical element of how the Delta operates, and how the people of the Delta function together, that system of rights that's established uh, are foundational to how we all relate to each other uh, and other, other folks as well. And then, and then last, um, and perhaps um, equally important with everything I've said, is the cornerstone that agriculture provides for the community. Uh, and and I, didn't, I didn't necessarily see agriculture called out uh, as the, so that it rises to the important level to which it really functions um, here in the Delta. Uh, it, it, in a, the, the report has done a great job of following the categories in the law, and that's really important to do, but it seemed to me that it sort of stopped after following the categories and didn't recognize the interrelationships between the categories and agriculture, flood protection, uh, the special districts and the relationships we have here in the Delta and what they need and make everything going together. Any questions? This is your chance to ask questions. I know I do not have to remind you to be, feel free to submit written comments. As a matter of fact, I read one of your written comments to the Water Board on one of your clients' cases uh, earlier this week. But, but that, those thoughts and those details are really important, Mark because this is not easy stuff to consider and let alone organize and integrate. You know, you keep, somebody raises the subject uh, endangered species or uh, non-native species, and four days later, that's all you've talked about, and then you've got to go back to the other things. So how you approach it is really important. Your comments are appreciated very much. And I want to ask you to please come back, uh, as, as I think you implied that you would, uh, not only to this community, but to the other communities in the Delta as you go through the process. I know that the statutory process for developing the EIR could mean you just sort of, I st we stop, get the scoping comments, and then uh, you know, launch the, the, well, the three-volume work. We're, and we're uh, required by law to at meet at least two days a year in the statutory Delta. Of course, we're meeting in the West Sacramento City Hall most of the time, which is in the secondary zone of the Delta. That isn't a problem. We're going to try to get out as much as we possibly can during this process. It, uh, this last seven-day scoping meeting around the state uh, has stretched uh, everybody's ability, but that's what you've got to do. Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mark Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Um, one thing I'm concerned about uh, is the time frames that you're talking about uh, having to, to meet by law. Uh, my, uh, my advice would be don't worry about the time frames. Uh, 
we don't get budgets on time, we don't get anything else done on time in California, and I don't see anybody going to jail over it. So I think the, the process should be uh, longer and more deliberative uh, than, than your statutory deadline. And if this is truly going to be a plan that affects all parts of the state, uh, I would hope that these scoping meetings would be in more, there would be many more of them in, in all parts of the state, not just one down in Diamond Bar and one up in Redding and, or, or whatever, and that there'd be um, extensive meetings throughout the state so uh, there is time and, and enough input to do a, a program that maybe can stand the, the test of time. Um, uh, another um, observation is uh, when you're doing your uh, plan, uh, Delta plan, I hope we'll, uh, the council will look favorably and long at the Delta Protection Commission's management plan that was recently updated. I think it has a uh, uh, I think it's a pretty modern plan for uh, at least uh, operations within the Delta. I hope you will consider those. Uh, I hope also in, as these uh, seven drafts go along that uh, they will all be, uh, all come with uh, numbered line and pages so we can uh, make it easier to we, comment we, on those. Well, uh, we have a mutual concern because we have to read all these drafts ourselves, and so we are desperately anxious to uh, have numbered lines, and our consultants, and Ms. Bocholtz, who's the lead consultant on doing this, has assured us that that's her desire, too. When you do so, when you do so many of these changes, you got to follow it and track it that way, and that'll be on our website. Uh, on our documents before this, we set up a pattern, I think by May of last year, where we were doing the original draft and then both clean copy and a red line edited copy. That would be very any helpful. changes. Yeah, it, it gets complicated in any event, but that's our intention to pursue that format. Thank you. Um, also, I hope, um, uh, well, uh, flow standards will be addressed uh, and um, that, I don't know how that process is going to go and uh, what enforceable standards there are, and we'll see as this process moves forward. Uh, but uh, there's been a lot of talk about diversions with, uh, in the different watersheds. I hope there will also be uh, diversions and additions within the different watersheds and uh, not just a, an exclusive look at diversions. So we see what's going back in from the different watersheds versus can, what's can, being Would you uh, like diverted. to come with us, Ch Chico, tomorrow night so you can argue that to some of your friends up there who I think have a different opinion? That they don't want to see what additions go back into the no, system? No, they, they just generally resist the notion that they have to be dragged into the problems of the Delta, uh, feeling that they have made enough environmental commitments upstream, and it's not their it's not really their problem. Well, whatever, whatever they think uh, or whatever anybody thinks, I'd like to see in the report uh, both uh, uh, additions as well as diversions uh, to the watersheds, all, it, all the watersheds. By additions, you mean? I mean water that enters the system. You mean additional water that's uses? Water diverted, water that goes back into the system again after usage. Right. I mean, in the, if you look at the delta here, uh, we're, we're probably a uh, uh, pretty good net contributor to the system because we're, we're pumping water out all winter. And uh, we're probably pumping out more than's coming in. So, and, uh, and that water quality is, uh, often goes out better than when it comes into our district. So that's something I hope you'll also be uh, addressing. Um, uh, I have a question about how the what you're going to be doing an EIR and and the timing uh, of the BDCP EIR and the EIR for the uh, council here for the council's plan um, and you're going to be you're going to be adding possibly the BDCP's plan to the Delta plan and I have a real concern about an EIR being done on the 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 Delta Stewardship Council's plan before an EIR is done on the BDCP plan, and I'm not quite sure what the relationship is going to be between those two EIRs. Uh, are they going to have to somehow comply or, or, or go along with what was uh, 
uh, passed with the EIR for the uh, uh, Delta Stewardship Council plan. Uh, I, I can see them being at odds with each other. Right. And then if that were to happen, how would, uh, how would they, uh, how, how would those be uh, uh, fixed, the two of them, well, to, to work together? As you know, as well as anybody else, there are dozens of various activities and programs and studies that go on. But the Bay Delta Conservation Plan was the large one started by Governor Schwarzenegger in 2006. And its focus primarily was uh, new facilities in the Delta for water export, plus the environmental and other mitigation activities that were related to any new study. They were supposed to have completed their work by now. No surprise, it hasn't been completed. It is, a, it is after all, deeply controversial. To, that's the minimum, bare minimum to say about it. But the statute told us to consider all kinds of plans, and with the exception of a couple from the Delta Protection Commission, one of the members is sitting here right now, uh, Supervisor Reagan, you're on DPC, yeah. Uh, with the exception of a couple plans they're gonna produce, none of the others, as best I can tell, will be ready. BDCP is just one. The Central Valley Flood Control Study was supposed to be completed 2011, then it got an extension for 2012, then they got an extension to 2014, and the last word we heard is they're only gonna have a conceptual plan in 2014, and then they'll make all their choices in 2017. Well, Joe says they're not that far behind. Uh, we've so far uh, concluded that our direction is real clear. I mean, there were no exceptions in the statute, and I've, since I've been involved in many of these discussions, as Pat Johnston has, on all these range of issues for most of our adult life, as you have, uh, there, these issues are not new. The solutions are controversial, and the choices are tough to make. Uh, we're just going to have to use the best available science, the best available factual information that's available, and cobble it together. But the statute is clear. If BDCP is completed, whether it's one year, two years, three years, four years after we complete our Delta plan, and they meet all the environmental requirements, and the Department of Fish and Game certifies they've met those requirements, then we have to incorporate in the Delta plan unless the, any person appeals the fish and game determination to us, so we're a possible appellate body. So we're being real careful not to try to violate that potential appellate role uh, whenever it happens. But that is an unusual aspect of this law, not commonly seen. It, it lays out a clear course of action both for BDCP, but for us in dealing with the reports. On the other reports, they are largely, they're overwhelmingly discretionary for us to accept all or part of them as they as we believe they meet the, the co-equal goals. All right, and if, you, and if the Delta Stewardship Council has its uh, conservation plan as part of its plan and uh, it gets through the EIR and, and uh, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan completes its EIR and, uh, and they wind up having contradictory uh, aspects to those two plans. Now you have two totally separate plans that have been through t their EIRs. There's the EIR for the Bay Delta Conservation Plan and, and the conservation actions there going to supersede those of the Delta Stewardship Council or Delta Stewardship Council's going to uh, uh, well, we, be we above have, those? Or? We, we we have many requirements of law that the Bay Delta Conservation Plan does not. For example, we're required to promote and encourage statewide water conservation. That's not their purpose. We are required to do ecosystem protection and activities in the entire statutory delta. They are only, and Susan Marsh, they are only obligated to do things in the EIR law relevant to either CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, or those two higher level federal and state environmental process that are involved, not the whole thing. We're required to come up with financing plans, take the state economy into account, do a host of things. The Delta is placed discussion, they are not. Yes, there will be areas of overlap. I suspect that significant portions of their mitigation proposals, their restoration proposals, will surface in our plan, but I don't know that for sure, and we're only gonna be able to review 
the public documents in the BDCP process. Because we have an appellate role, we're not going to see any secret documents. That's one of the things we're being very careful about. So there's no perfect answer. But the statute says that state agencies are required to comply with the Delta plan for covered actions. They don't like that a lot, but that's what the statute says. So, so what you're saying then is that the uh, BDCP uh, uh, mitigation plan and so forth be, be um, actually in agreement with the plan that the Delta Stewardship Council uh, does for, for in-Delta um, well, conservation yeah, measures. I think it's fair to say ours covers a, covers a larger territory. I know, I know you, you, yeah. you said that. Yeah. But I'm talking about stuff within the area that BDCP is going to do conservation measures. If, there's, if their um, for, uh, actions are going to be in conflict with Delta Stewardship Council's actions within that same area, whose plan will supersede the others? Well, if we have, we, we will act long before they are concluded their business. I suspect some of our judgments are going to eventually affect their recommendations should they reach agreement. I can't promise you that, can't guarantee that, but I think it's likely. At the same time, if there are direct conflicts within the meaning of the statute, and if that plan from BDCP reflects the highest environmental laws required by the State Delta Protection Act, then we're required to take it in, but we always have that appellate role to determine whether Fish and Game's determination was correct. Now, that isn't the perfect answer, but it's the closest I can get for you. Okay, looking forward to seeing the drafts and red line additions and... So, so am I. ...lined and numbered and so forth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bill Wells, the California Delta Chamber and Visitors Bureau. Mr. Wells. Yeah, Mr. Eisenberg and uh, Mr. Grindstaff, thank you folks very much for coming and allowing me to speak. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of the California Delta Chambers and Visitors Bureau. I'm happy to see a few of our members out in the audience here. That's wonderful. Um, our main concern is uh, the business people and uh, farmers and uh, residents of the Delta. Uh, in your own literature here, um, you say that Delta is the largest estuary in the West Coast, the United, or the, on the West Coast. That's true, the uh, Colorado River Delta was once larger, it was destroyed by water diversions back in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, but it looks to us like this is what's happening here. Um, as we speak, the uh, Bay, Delta Con Bay Delta Conservation Plan folks are planning to divert the Sacramento River with two tunnels that'll be able to take 75% of the water out of the river um, and divert it. So we, uh, we think this is gonna be a huge disaster and I'm calling upon you as the uh, Stewardship Council to help uh, stop that. And I'm also calling on the citizens of California to help prevent that. It's going to be a, a nightmare. Uh, earlier speakers said the cost was approximately $20 billion. I think the reality is it's going to be 50 to $70 billion. So uh, it's going to uh, have a huge impact on the state of California. I'd just like to uh, quote a couple of things. People say I'm always making up my own facts, so I don't <laughs> I always quote other people. Uh, this is from uh, Assemblymember Jared Huffman talking about the uh, salmon run uh, this earlier in 2010, just about a year ago. He said the, uh, the salmon season closing is an uh, economic impact of $2 billion with about 23,000 jobs lost. Well, a lot of that's caused by the, the water flows in the river, so uh, that's a huge impact. And um, you can talk about the co-equal goals, but uh, one of the goals cannot be diverting the river around the Delta, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Westlands Water District is a huge user of Delta water, uh, and here's the information I pulled off their website a while back. In many parts of the district, salts are accumulating in the soil from the application of imported irrigation water. And uh, so you all know about Kestersen and stuff. This is, again, this is Westlands own uh, verbiage. Um, and they say, without a long-term solution, the drainage problem will become more widespread and severe throughout the west side. Well, the easy solution I see is uh, let them build desal plants and pull water out of the ocean. And the most disturbing thing, uh, the root of all this seems to be the California Department of Water Resources. This weekend, uh, the Delta Chambers had their uh, booth at the, uh, Cal the International Sportsman's Expo at Cal Expo. 
And uh, we had a booth there. Department of Water Resources had a booth there three times bigger than ours. In fact, they're three times bigger than just about anybody else's. They were passing out literature touting the uh, benefits of uh, the state water project and the recreation opportunities. Well, they talk about everywhere in California except the Delta. And their, again, their map uh, that I'm holding up um, doesn't even show roads in the Delta. They show obscure, like Highway 4 goes way up into the mountains, but they don't even show it going through the Delta. Highway 160 apparently stops at Antioch. So uh, it looks like to me the Department of Water Resources has written off the Delta, and uh, I'm very disturbed. So I call, again, I call upon all citizens and the Stewardship Council to help uh, prevent this diversion. Thank you, sir. One Thank final you. question, Mr. Eisenberg, yes, sir. if I could. Are you growing a mustache? Uh, only because I shaved at 6 o'clock this morning. Oh, okay. that way. <laughs> anyway, so thank, thank you very much. Did thank you, you Mr. Wells. That? No, that, thank oh, you very thank much. Thank you. Mr. Brett Baker. Baker. When we were down here the last time in uh, Cortland, Mr. Baker made what he alleged was his first presentation to the Stewardship Council. I, that can't have been your first presentation. That was too good. Good to see you again. Good to, be, good to be here. Um, you have to forgive me. I wrote down my comments. Uh, hopefully one day I'll be as uh, eloquent as Mr. Van Loben's else when I get up to speak. But um, I prepared this this afternoon under the premise I was only going to have three minutes. So uh, if you want to start your clock, it should only take me two minutes keep, and 47 keep talking. seconds. Keep talking. Okay. <clears throat> good evening. My name is Brett Baker, and I'm a sixth generation resident of Sutter Island. I feel like I know most of you folks in the room here. So coming down a little bit. <clears throat> I'd like to start by taking a moment to recognize we truly live in the greatest country on earth, uh, one like, the, uh, like this, where we can peacefully congregate uh, to have such public discourse. Uh, it's uh, really something special. I don't think we'd be doing this anywhere else on the globe. So I'm sure many of you have come here this evening to offer input to the Stewardship Council's Delta plan. Uh, this 50-year plan, plan will dictate how our Delta will look in the future. Uh, I struggled while composing my comments for the evening. Uh, how could I possibly convey what I see as necessary components for a comprehensive Delta plan in just three minutes? Again, I was going on this assumption I only had three minutes here. I came to the realization that I could not. There are just too many aspects to the Delta. Far too many ongoing processes, local issues, statewide issues, ecological issues, economic issues, public safety issues. Heck, it'd take you more than three minutes just to list the issues. And I'm sure that there are even some issues that have yet to be discussed. I'm also positive, as Phil would tell you and has told us this evening, that uh, this plan is coming as sure as death and taxes. <clears throat> and I know that there are folks in this room to, uh, tonight with thoughts, ideas, and invaluable firsthand knowledge of how to best deal with these issues. I believe it is imperative that we, the Delta community, ensure the incorporation of our knowledge and input as we will be lining, uh, living out this plan day to day on the ground as it is implemented. We would be greatly amiss to not engage in this planning process for the vacuum we leave by abstaining will surely be filled by other outside competing interests. I work with many honest, focused, talented, and experienced individuals at Restore the Delta a new locally established nonprofit group committed to giving Delta residents a voice in this process that stands to massively alter the landscape of our homes and our ways of life. So in closing, if three minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes isn't enough for you, <clears throat> please come join us. We want your input, we will listen, we will comment, and we will be heard. Thank you all for taking the time to hear me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Mr. Baumgartner, Mr. Baumgartner, there you are. Hi, my name is Wally Baumgartner. I'm a local resident. My wife and I w walked over here this evening. We're uh, Clarksburg's newest residents. We've been here three years. We bought maybe the oldest house built in 1873. Depends what plan. We've all seen plans on the tunnel and the peripheral canal. They're going to take our house. It's walking distance from here. That's plan KYWZ, right? Our dream is going to be shattered, and they're going to try to shatter everybody's dreams in here. 
that lives down here with this program. They said one person, the DFG uh, director of the DFG, who's an appointed position, is going to decide on the peripheral canal whether he likes the EIR or not. You can't, you, that, the, the whole thing's flawed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Marchand, Yolo County. Ms. Marchand? There you are. Good to see you again. Good evening. Oops, a little high for me. Patricia Marchand, I'm here tonight representing Supervisor Mike McGowan and the rest of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, Supervisor McGowan apologizes. He couldn't be here tonight himself. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, thank you for coming to Clarksburg for this meeting. The Board of Supervisors very much appreciates your willingness to have a meeting here and listen to all the residents in this room. And then I'm also here to tell you that we are sending, pr proposing written comments to the Board of Supervisors tomorrow, so I won't take time tonight to go over those comments, but we'll only say that they do reflect a lot of the things that you heard in this room already from various residents, including minimizing economic impacts, protecting agriculture, ensuring adequate flood protection, and a number of the other themes that you've heard the Yolo County Board of Supervisors uh, present to you on numerous occasions. So we'll have more detailed comments to you after the board has a chance to review, but we again appreciate uh, the opportunity for the community to comment tonight. Uh, Supervisor McGowan threatened uh, last month, said, Phil, if you don't do what we say we th you think you should do, I'm gonna set my band up right outside <laughs> your meeting and we're gonna play all the way through the whole thing. Do you think he's gonna deliver on that threat? You know, I wouldn't put anything past Supervisor McGowan. So. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bob Schneider. Mr. Schneider? There you are, sir. Hi, I'm Bob Schneider. I'm the Senior Policy Director for Tuliomi, which is a conservation organization of 501c3 based in Yolo County. Uh, and our concerns embrace the environmental resources and decision-making process that affect the North Delta. Uh, we're submitting some coping comments here, and I'll briefly go through some of those. Um, it's clear the Delta ecosystem is in a state of ongoing collapse, and whether we're living here or we're farmers or, or plants and animals, the threat of collapse through earthquake or flood uh, is very real, and you know something needs to get done or we will lose the Delta. Um, planning's desperately needed. We appreciate that work that you're doing. The process is particularly important. I think a number of people have referred to that in this room. Some of the things we think need to be done include restoring adequate flows for delta and fisheries. Uh, we want to make sure that a full range of, of uh, conveyance facilities are, are looked at in terms of reliability. We are certainly concerned about capacity and what that means and what governance structures set up to ensure that the rules that are put in place stay in place. Um, we think we need to, re to, to reduce the reliance on the Delta uh, in its watersheds. That has to come a lot from uh, water conservation, uh, both urban and agriculture, wastewater recycling, groundwater management, urban stormwater capture. Uh, restoring and protecting habitat is important, and in this region, working with the Yellow uh, Natural Heritage Program uh, is going to be really important to ensuring success in that effort. Um, you know, I've worked in water quality issues, and I think that's a big concern. There's certainly those concerns and are not being addressed adequately in the region, and we recently went through the process for the uh, del delta methylmercury uh, total maximum daily load plan is an example of the kind of work and many other pollutants uh, that needs to get done. Um, grounding this in the biological objectives and good science that you've actually alluded to, we appreciate that. That'll be really important to success in the future. Also looking at just who's going to pay for this and the fact that what water is diverted from the delta should be paid by water users. and. Um, that how we sort that out, I think, will be uh, important. Uh, making sure the Delta has a fair say in this process, they're listened to, and um, their concerns are addressed or of concern. And one that's really important to me personally in our organization is environmental justice issues, engaging environmental justice community, providing them with the capacity to be able to participate in a meaningful manner throughout the process, getting them involved early on is going to be really critical to the long-term success of this plan. 
So we'll submit a written comments on that, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to comment. And it's nice to be here in Clarksburg. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, from the Hoopa Valley Tribe, uh, Allie Hostler. Ms. Hostler? Uh, Ian, you better try the other mic. We've been getting better sound from that than the one over here. Well, my name's Allie Hostler. I'm from the Hoopa Tribe, which, if you don't know, is way far north on the Trinity River. Still the largest tribe in California by membership, I think. Not by membership, Not by, by land member base. By land base, okay, land yeah, base. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> And I, like the young guy over here, uh, wrote things down because I'm not the greatest. I get nervous. But um, in its natural course, the Trinity River flows through my tribe's reservation. It's the source of the fishery on which my people have depended on since time immemorial. My tribe also has vested property rights established under federal statutes, judi judicial decisions, and administrative actions. Currently, on average, 53% of our river is exported out of our basin and into the Sacramento River watershed. Trinity River water has made possible irrigation in both the Sacramento River Valley, Valley as well as south of the Delta and the San Joaquin River Valley. Laws regarding Trinity River water, such as the 2000 Record of Decision, the 1955 Trinity River Division Act, <clears throat> make the following separate and distinct volumes and uses of Trinity River water unavailable for use in any Delta plan. The Trinity River record of decision flows arrived at by a federally solicited flow study that identified needed flows for fisheries restoration. Currently, I think it's on a, on a normal water year, it's 47% of the river stays in the Trinity River or in the Trinity Basin. By the way, Trinity is the only imported source of water into the Sacramento watershed. Also, more water that shouldn't be considered available in the Delta Plan is water promised to Humboldt County in the 1955 Trinity River Division Act of 50,000 acre feet. It's in the second proviso of the 1955 Act that authorized the division of the Trinity River. Humboldt County, over 50 years later, still hasn't, hasn't seen that water. Also, County of Origin rights of Trinity County <clears throat> it's my understanding that the current hydrological modeling for the Delta plan considers those amounts of water available for exports south of the Delta. This is something that hopefully is corrected. And like you said, it's going to go through many stages. Hopefully the modeling will reflect those waters staying in the Trinity River Basin. And I understand this is sort of a odd place for me to be. I happen to be in the area and I thought I would come check this out and I'm glad I did because I think I can relate to a lot of you on on some of your issues and if your community is worried about exports, you should be. They told us in 19 in 1950s they were going to take 17 percent of Trinity River water and we fought hard not to allow that to happen. They ended up taking 90 percent of the water and then at 50 and then 90% of our fish died. And now, 50 years later, we got, we got a 50 or 47% of the water back. We're still fighting for water. We should be afraid of exports. Anything that expedites, anything that set, you know, is a, uh, there's plumbing all the way south for water as far north as we are. If you look at your red map, we're up here at the very tip of this red thing right there. And we're, and we're talking Trinity River water is pumped through a mountain. They blasted a tunnel through a mountain, pumped it into the Sacramento, and it comes all the way down here to you guys, and it has the potential to go all the way down. We should be afraid of exports. So, but thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Peter Stone. Mr. Stone. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak and to, to make some comments. Uh, I'm Peter Stone. For 10 years, my family and I have lived on the other side of the Sacramento River in Sacramento County. 
Uh, we have learned firsthand living on a farm what, what value there is in the farming within the, uh, within the, the delta firsthand. We've, we've learned an awful lot. Um, and I, just to identify, if you look at those BDCP maps, you look at the first intake plant, it's smack on top of our house that we restored a 120-year-old house. So we have a, a vested interest in, in, in what happens there. But I, I wanted to follow on with something that Russell had said um, a little earlier. You know, when you think about the Delta Stewardship Council, I think one of the keys is, uh, from my standpoint, what I've seen in the 10 years that I've been around is that farmers and landowners do provide a great deal of stewardship of the Delta and what's going on around here that if, if, if we weren't here, the farmers in particular and those who care about this area, things would be in a whole different set of uh, conditions than they are now. Um, if we are driven off economically, as Russell was alluding to, one of the key partners in the Delta stewardship um, you know, may just be eliminated, the stewardship of the Delta in the long term. But the, the thing that I'd like to have considered actually in the, um, in the EIR or, or whatever is the appropriate document is, is sort of an expansion of one of the things that Russell said. Over half a million acres in the primary delta uh, have a complete, at least half a million, have a complete financial cloud over them due to this entire process of BDCP and the things that have been going on. I've actually seen personally know of property sales that have actually been stopped as of now, just because of the fact of the disclosures that have to be made about the impact on values. Um, getting loans has, has been impacted um, because of the property, what's your property worth if it's supposed to be security on for such a loan. And, and the ability to make a long-term investment is, is really brought into question. So those are some impacts that are there, but over a long period of time, uh, the values being impacted in my mind, render this concept of eminent domain excessively ineffective. So the thing I'd like to have considered, the impact on people and landowners needs to be dealt with so that eminent domain won't be applied to artificially depressed land values by this process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Uh, let's see, uh, Mr. Bob uh, Riopel wanted to make some general comments. Let's do that now. And then I'm going to ask uh, for others who haven't yet submitted a form uh, who want to talk. Thank you. My name is Bob Riopel. I represent uh, recreational boaters. Just a couple of comments. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Riopel has punished himself by attending both the Sacramento <laughs> session this morning and tonight. Okay. Why anyway. did you do that? <laughs> Two in a row. Two, I thought they might be a little bit different. But anyway, thank you for being here. Thanks to the other uh, members of the council for being here. And thanks for the opportunity to speak. Just a couple of comments. Uh, I want to re uh, reference uh, sections 85.022, uh, where it talks about recreational activities. And uh, specifically what I mentioned is, is to maintain recreational boaters in the Delta, what we really need is, is dredging for a lot of the, the, the uh, levees, a lot of the, the sloughs and, and rivers, and, and a lot of the and more treatment of weed, uh, weed abatement treatment. And that doesn't seem to be anywhere in there. I do appreciate the... Uh, the uh, section on page 29 on, on recreation in the, in the notice, uh, but it's very ambiguous, and I'd like to have, uh, hoping the plan is more specific plans to, to uh, 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 plans to encourage and, and to uh, uh, enhance the delta for recreational boating. We, uh, we produced early, and I frankly don't remember why, an, an inventory of all the sources we could find of recreational activity in and around the delta, and I think it was a somebody's request out of the Clarksburg meeting, but don't hold me to that, uh, the first meeting. Uh, and that's on our website somewhere, and you might want to take a look at okay. that, because that was the first shot we made at an inventory of everything anyone could think about. Great, thanks, yeah. I'll, I'll okay. look at that. And then the other comment is uh, on the, uh, and it's mentioned here, by the way, thank you for the list of the rec reclamation districts. I was amazed at how many there were. <laughs> Probably a lot of people were. Um, and I'm concerned about that because I, the few that I know about, a lot of them really don't have the resources to maintain the levees. And I hope in the plan that you'll deal with uh, how to maintain the levees, that, that, that uh, maybe not all of them, but at least the, the, the important ones, because I don't think a lot of these districts have the ability to do so. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if th uh, those of you who have not submitted a form want to talk anyway, uh, now's the time to do it. We would appreciate it. Yeah, hey, how are you, John? Good to see you. Come on up. Try that mic. It's probably better. Well, Phil, I'm going to bring up an old subject, Fish and Wildlife Service and Stone Lakes Wildlife Refuge. <laughs> we ended up suing them over their EIR, and we got absolutely nowhere. They didn't have to answer anything. All they had to do is mention the problem. And uh, John, hopefully... For, for, for the court reporter, could you identify yourself oh, by name? And John, name? John Baronic. Yeah. Uh -oh. Cortland. Yes, prominent, prominent farmer, uh, activist. Come on now. Friend. <laughs> Give yeah. me a break. But anyway, um, I hope your charge uh, is that you will answer the problems and not just mention the problems. John, there's some, the, the law, unfortunately, didn't tell us to do everything and give us power over all federal and state agencies. So I can't promise that we can control the federal government. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good to see you. Okay, uh, yes, other folks who'd like to talk. Sir, please. And if you could give your name and if you have a business or an association you're representing, do that too, please. If we might have trouble spelling it, the court reporter would ask you to spell it out. Okay. Uh, my name is Tim Newharth, N-E-U-H-A-R-T-H, -E a uh, farmer in the Cortland area. Um, I hear this rhetoric all the time, and I, I just can't sit in my seat and not make comment. Um, on page two, or I'm sorry, on page five, you need stronger glasses, uh, your fourth bullet point, uh, it goes on to say, recent events like the Lower Jones Track levee failure, Hurricane Katrina, and recent findings that indicate a two in three chance of a major earthquake occurring in or near the Delta in the next 50 years, on and on and on it goes. Number one, Hurricane to, to, to Katrina, we hear this over and over again, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, and what it's going to do, how it uh, you know, relates to the Delta and all this stuff. It, and it does not relate to the Delta. But yet this verbiage continues to be put in publications from one end of this spectrum to the other. Hurricane Katrina, we do not have hurricanes here. We do not have 20-foot storm surges. And we do not have U.S. Army Corps of Engineered walls that fail. We don't have any of that here. Hurricane Katrina has nothing to do with what goes on in this Delta other than the fact that it scares the hell out of people. Hurricane Katrina, oh my god, the sky is falling. But it's, it keeps it in the public's eye. It does do that. But to, to keep talking about Hurricane Katrina as it relates to the Delta is a farce, an absolute farce. You talk about a major earthquake in the Delta, there has never been a levee failure in the Delta due to an earthquake, ever. Now, you can put whatever you want in your computer models, but history would have to set the precedence on how you determine what may happen in the future. And there has not been a levee failure due to an earthquake here. My other point is that this is the Delta Stewardship Council. You are engaged in, by name, and by your mission statement, if you will, to protect and enhance the Delta. Bullet point number one up here, the Delta is in a state of... Uh, the Delta is a source of water for farmlands, growing communities, businesses, provides unique estuarine habitat for many resident and migratory fish and birds, some listed as threatened or endangered species. The, everybody knows, common sense would tell you, that you cannot do co-equal goals with the amount of water that you've got coming into the Sacramento River through the Delta. If we're going to take X amount of acre feet of water or cubic feet per second or whatever you want to term it, to the extent that they're proposing to do BDCP, there is no way that you can keep the delta anywhere near where it is today. And it's already threatened. It's already um, um, going downhill. The State uh, Water Resources Control Board and their findings recently said that there needs to be less water taken out of the delta, not more, in order for it to be sustainable or to be restored or whatever you want to put onto it. So, co-equal goals, I'm waiting for the day that some committee, 
stewardship council, Delta protection people, whoever, somebody will stand up and say, there is no way we can do co-equal goals with the amount of water that we have available to us at the moment. That's not going to happen unless you have more storage up north where you can bring water back down here and make it up for whatever you're shipping south. It's not going to happen. That's just common sense. Please, will somebody stand up and say it is not possible to have co-equal goals with the amount of water we have flowing to the Sacramento River? Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, there's a lady with her hand up in back. Do you wish to talk? Sorry. Anyone else like to talk to us on this? Yes, please. Good evening. Don't bother. I'm not going to be long. <laughs> My name... My name is Rajin Reynolds. I'm from the South Delta, a mile north of Old River. My family farms and has farmed on Middle River since the 1880s. Middle River goes backwards when the pumps go off. I only have one thing to say. Patrick, 20 years ago, about, you stood with us in the South Delta and on Roberts Island when Lathrop wanted to put their sewer on our property. You remember that. That was, you're laughing. You find I'm it humorous. I, I'm smiling because you're going to mention me next, I'm sure. No. No? Okay. You have not stood with us. Okay. All right. You stood with us, and we held off Lathrop. And what we held off, Mr. Eisenberg, was the effects of urban development upon the Delta and the Delta Protection Commission was formed. What we are facing now are devastating urban effects and southern San Joaquin farming effects of water diversion. It's as simple as that. You, if you're going to be our steward, then just as the gentleman before me said, you need to reevaluate your co-equal goals and this delta and the 150-year-old farmland upon it needs to have just as much respect as any other area, or your plan is going to fail. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Anyone else, please? Anyone else? On any subject remotely remitted? Is that, is that another Whisper Wilson coming up? I can't. Yes, I think so. Something you mentioned this evening, <clears throat> which uh, I think I've heard before, but it always bothered me a little bit. That was that uh, you plan to have 65,000 acres, is it, of, uh, of what? That was a reference to the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, which has tentatively identified 65,000 acres of land the, for possible habitat and restoration. Now, where are you going to find that? Well, it's their plan. I don't know where they're going to find it. 43,000 acres of land in the Delta today are owned by governments. That's the starting point. Uh, so, presumptively, some of that land is for that purpose. Others, they're just going to have to find. I don't know where. You have no idea where this 65,000 acres is going to come from. It could come from right here in Clarksburg, couldn't it? Gee, I don't know about that. Uh, all I can tell you is that there have been numerous studies that have identified types of habitat and possible areas of habitat uh, eligible for preservation. Well, the only point I'm trying to make is that there's maybe more things here that we got to worry about and we got it, than we've heard about yet on the, in, this play, uh, in this meeting. And uh, I... Uh, well, that's the main thing I wanted to point I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay.
All right, next person. Anyone else? Anyone else? Going once. Going twice. Sold. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just a, a request. Any thoughts you have, elaborations on points you made, things you, you didn't say but you'd want to put in writing, uh, as I advised, uh, chatted with Mr. Loeb and Sells about, it's very important that we get as much of your comments as early as we possibly can. The website information's on the material that was distributed. Please use it. Get us to us as fast as you can. Thank you for coming.